What's going on hybrid shooters? It's Jason Vaughn currently in Seoul, South Korea. So I've been shooting on the Sony cameras for the last five years now and have discovered a lot of little tricks that help me speed up my workflow and I would love to share with you some of them today to hopefully help you spend less time editing and more time shooting photos and videos. Special thanks to Dell for sponsoring these tips. I'll be demoing my workflow on the Dell Precision 5750 17-inch mobile workstation, but keep this in mind. The tips I'll be sharing today are not exclusive to this machine. A lot of what I'll be sharing can be done on any computer, but I'll show you how Dell and NVIDIA RTX can help speed up photo and video processing through GPU acceleration. For more info on the Precision Workstation line, go to dell.com creators or find a link in the description box below. So tip number one, I like to star my photos on the spot. If I know I took a good photo, I immediately give it a one star rating. That way I can find it easily and start editing my photos later. Now this is immensely helpful because if you're like me, we accidentally take hundreds and thousands of photos a day. I developed this habit as an event photographer where I would need to deliver my photos either the same day or the next day. And the last thing I want to do is to be reliving the same day by going through thousands of images just to pick out my best shots and start editing. Now, on Sony cameras, you have an option to give a photo up to a five star rating, but I only enable one star because I just need to let my future self know that these are the shots that I think have potential. I would do another round of calling on the computer where I would narrow down my picks even more and the ones that I like the most, I give it a two star rating. So those will be the ones I will edit. Tip number two, use the free Sony Viewer app to help you organize your photos. This is particularly helpful if you shoot on high megapixel cameras like the A1 or the A7R series, because I found the viewer to be able to preview high megapixel shots much quicker compared to other similar programs. It allows you to preview the photos at decent quality before you import them into your editing app, and it shows you the star rating metadata that we talked about earlier. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think there's a way for Lightroom to show the star ratings first before import. You would have to import all the photos into the catalog first, which takes time before you can actually see the star ratings. It's just a little troublesome having to wait until I import all thousand images in and then delete the unrated ones. But hey, let me know if there's an easier way for Lightroom to only ingest the star rated photos. If not, here's what I like to do. The first photo I create contains the date and the title, either the project that I'm working on or the location that I was shooting at. And within that folder, I like to have four additional folders, deselects, selects, Lightroom, and export. Deselects is where I copy all my photos to. This is just in case if I wanna look through the non-rated images again, in case I miss something on the spot. But if I'm sure I don't need these photos anymore, I would just have to delete this one folder to save space on my hard drives. So after dumping all the photos into the first folder, I use the viewer app to sort out the starred photos and move them to the second folder, selects. Then I open Lightroom, create a new catalog in the third folder and import all the photos from my selects to edit. Once I'm done, I will export them into the export folder. Organization like this is key because when you need to find something or it's time for some spring cleaning, it's a lot less work to have to dig through all the photos that you've shot ages ago. So tip number three, renaming video files with Adobe Bridge. One of the common struggles I see online from video shooters is using multiple Sony cameras, but the file naming structure is the same, so it can get confusing when you start to edit them. You would have four different C0001.mp4 files. Now, newer Sony cameras, you can change that first letter into something else or have the date in front of the file name. But in case you don't have the newer Sony cameras, Adobe Bridge has a nice batch renaming feature. Since I pay a lot of money to Adobe, I might as well take advantage of their entire suite. But if you know a good free software that does batch renaming like Bridge, help the community out, drop in the comments down below. So when I rename my files, I like to either add the camera motto or A cam, B cam, or the camera operator's name. So there's at least some distinction between all the C0001.mp4s. Now I don't erase the original file name because in case I need to go back and find them from the SD card, I know what number to look for. I would only format the SD cards when I deliver the project or I at least have two backups of it. Renaming files is helpful when you you are passing the project off to another editor using a different machine. So when they have the hard drive and they need to reconnect all the files in the project again, the software will not get confused. 
Tip number four, making proxies for 8K, 4K, or 4K 10-bit 422 videos. Now, I don't often need to do it nowadays for regular 4K 8-bit videos and even 10-bit 420 videos because Premiere takes advantage of the NVIDIA RTX card to decode the footage for smoother timeline playback. However, for really complicated files like 10-bit 422 and even 8K shot in H.265, I would still need to render proxies for these particular files. In Premiere Pro, you can actually do this by right-clicking on all of your footage and create proxies. Choose Format, QuickTime, and ProRes Low Resolution Proxy. If you don't have the ProRes option for whatever reason, Cineform works too. Unfortunately, this will create a large file per footage that you're trying to make a proxy of, but trust me, it will make your editing life so much easier, especially if you're shooting 10-bit 422 on the A7S III, A1, or the FX3. Or even if you're using an older machine and trying to edit 4K files off of the A7 III or the 6400. Now, I know what you might be asking. Why not turn on proxy recording and camera? Well, you could do that, but I found out that certain Sony cameras disable features like face autofocus, so not worth it in my opinion. Now, a couple of things to make sure that you're optimizing Premiere for render, playback, and export. When you're creating a new project, you want to make sure that your render is set to CUDA if you have an NVIDIA card. Next, you want to go to File, Preferences, Media, and check H.264, HEVC, Hardware Accelerated Decoding and Encoding for best timeline playback and exporting. And when you export, make sure you select hardware encoding for faster export. Now, you might have noticed that I directly import my files onto the computer itself, and that's because I find Premiere reads and plays back my files easier and faster, which is why I don't have to make proxies for my 4K files. You see, when you connect external hard drives, you potentially run into two problems. One, the connection may not be as fast as your internal SSD, so it can affect playback performance. And two, if I need to edit outside of the comforts of my own home, which I kind of have to because I'm currently in Korea right now, I don't need to worry about accidentally knocking or disconnecting my external drives and risking corruption. Whenever I upgrade to the next editing machine, I make sure to have at least two terabyte of internal storage. Once I'm done with the project, I move it off a backup drive later. Moving on to tip number five, easy S-log grading. I've always struggled to get S-log footage looking good, but in the last year, I've come across these amazing Venice lookluts from Alistair Chapman, a legend in the Sony cinema camera scene. Now, you might have heard about the notorious Venice color science and how it has great cinematic expression and the most flattering skin tones. Well, unfortunately, not all of us are James Cameron, so we don't have access to the actual Venice camera, but these LUTs here were devised to give a very similar look when you shoot an S-log. Also, not everyone can get the A1 FX3 or the A7S3 for the new Cinetone profile, so this might be the next best option for you. So download it, it's free, give it a try, and if you like it, consider donating to Alistair. I don't personally know him, and he sure as hell don't know me. And I don't profit from any of the donations, but I love to spread his work because I've learned so much from him over the years, and these LUTs are amazing. You know, I gotta say, color grading on a 17-inch display is really nice. I've never owned a 17-inch laptop before because I always fear it's too big or heavy, but this Dell Mobile workstation is surprisingly thin, and it still fits inside of my Peak Design Everyday Backpack, which is advertised like 15-inch max capacity. It is a snug fit though. Now I'm not gonna lie, while it does look thin, it's not that light, but for all the power it has and the comfort of editing on a bigger display, it's a fair trade-off, I'd say. Oh, and one quick thing about color for all my fellow Premiere users. If you find the color of your video export desaturated for whatever reason compared to what you were seeing when you were editing, get this QT Gamma Correction LUT and apply in your export window, and that should fix it. So hopefully this video has helped you guys out, and if you guys are in the market for a brand new laptop, don't forget to check out the Dell Precision Workstation. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you guys in the next video. Peace.